buttes were thrown out. And I thought if it's true, it could be evidence of this global awakening, but I never really dug into it too much. So when New Page sent me your book, I thought, yeah, maybe it's worth taking a deeper look at this idea. But for people who might not be familiar with the term indigo kids, and just to clarify what they are, can you give people your take on them? Uh, sure. Uh you know, there's a big umbrella, and under that umbrella, there would be sensitive children, all different mm -hmm. types of sensitive kids, including Asperger's and autism, all different types of sensitive kids. But indigo kids are have a high level of sensitivity, and they also have a high level of uh, intensity, which would be uh, like an angry type energy. And I don't want to say they're angry, but they have like a fierceness to them. Mm -hmm. So they hold what seem to be opposing qualities. So they have that in, that high sensitivity. They have that fierceness. And they also have a similar mindset. So they deeply want things to be fair. They want to be treated as equals. And then it can, you know, there's a whole list of things that they share as a collective. Um, but the reason I zeroed in on indigos is because they have that high level of sensitivity, high level of intuition, very gifted in certain areas, and also um, do have that fierceness that can go in a direction that would be considered skillful quickly or can be challenging as well. Yeah, it seems really interesting. Where did the term indigo kids come from? It came from a metaphysician in the 70s uh, who is now passed. Her name is Nancy Tate. And she uh, noticed, she was the first person to notice that the aura around these children ha tended to be the color indigo. And that color is associated with the uh, energy center of intuition, the third eye center, which is between uh. the eyes. And that's where they have this high level. Their their primary uh, intelligence is intuitive, although they are intelligent in all sorts of ways. They're very intuitive. See, that's really interesting, the third eye chakra aspect to it. So they seem to be more psychic, I guess. Are they more prone to seeing auras or energy healing, that kind of stuff? They're definitely prone to energy healing, and they're definitely very intuitive. I mean, all kids are intuitive, but some of these kids are just off the chart intuitive. Um, I recently worked with an indigo kid, and he was just born with this gift of energy healing. He naturally knew how to help someone go from feeling pain until feeling ease. He just was able to do it with his hands. So he was able to channel energy without any training, and he also remembered some of his past lives. So they have just a very strong level of intuition. The past lives thing, I mean, I find that really interesting. I hear a lot of people making the case for that, and I always love to hear stories of people that do recount some information from some previous life. Can you tell me the details of, of uh, his realization of, from a past life or his memories? Well, what, yeah, I mean, he, he was telling his mom, he was saying, hey, mom, don't you remember when we did X, Y, Z? And, you know, he's four years old, so there's no reason that he would remember something yeah. that it, this was the woman's grandmother, her mother, his grandmother that had passed. So it, it it appears to be from all the evidence that he reincarn that she reincarnated into her son, which is oh, so wow. right. And and she called everyone in the family after he was giving her all these details and said, Hey, did you ever, you know, have you ever said this? She really did her due diligence to be like, How did this child know? Was it a dream? Was it and he was just giving so many details and real information. There was just no other way for um, him to know this. So, you know, whether, of course, we cannot be definitive, but it was just all the evidence appears that, okay, there's something here going on that's clearly beyond um, what our senses can tell us. Yeah, that is wild. I've heard stories like that before. So, I mean, it's, you know, it's not totally anomalous. It's kind of crazy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and you mentioned that they seem to have this defiant or angry energy to them. Do you think that's part of the Indigo Kid package, or is that anger, that uh, defiance, is it more of a reaction to being just a young, enlightened being in a society full of unenlightened, uninspired, working-class adults that might make them feel a bit alienated? Well, certainly that doesn't help, but but their their energy is running faster than a lot of people's energy, and it's more intense. And um, that that intensity to them, you know, adults that have indigo children or adults who are indigos themselves, they know that intensity. They have this intensity to them. And it is a fierceness. It is, you know, when they want to do something, they want to do something. And they, if they do not want to do something, they will refuse. So there's this incredible fierceness to them. And when that's channeled for good, great things can happen in the world. So they are given that intensity and fierceness because one of the collective reasons that they came is to help break down systems that don't work in our world and create ones that do. Yeah, one part of uh, and 
one anecdote of intensity from your book is that there was one kid who was being bullied at school and his parents came to you because he had said, if you send me back to school, I'm killing myself. That is the end of discussion. Um, is that the kind of, I mean, that's definitely an intense statement. I mean, I've heard this a lot and I've worked with parents and children regarding this, but I think that intensity or a refusal to do something, what most of the mainstream world would call defiance, is how that energy appears. What it really is is fierceness and just energy that they need to channel for good. But it will come out as refusal. I refuse where, you know, 30, 40 years ago, kids might have felt that way, but they still went along with it because their parents like, you got to do this and there's no other choice. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, when parents say that, it just doesn't work out. Kids say, forget it. I'm not doing it. They're not programmable the way kids were in previous generations. They just say, I'm not doing it. Yeah, you know, that's the most enlightening and hopeful aspect of it. Um, you know, mm -hmm. if, you, if you're in the conspiracy wheelhouse and you feel like things are manipulated and people are programmed, the right. fact that they're resisting that, I mean, that's a, that's a very hopeful thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, they have an inner wisdom. So they're not looking to the outside world all the time to say, okay, what's true and what's not true. They really rely a lot on what's inside of them. And they don't care if you're their principal or their parent. If they don't think it's right, they're not going to do it. So... You know, of course, they still need our guidance, but um, there is there is uh, some wisdom that they come with. That's super interesting. Can you give us a couple more anecdotes about indigos you've worked with that would highlight their differences from regular kids? Um, that's a that's a good question. Um, you know, I think that giftedness and creativity are two other things that are off the charts for them. And when I say giftedness, I don't mean that they're, you know, A students. I mean, they have typically at least one area or one subject that they're really gifted in. It might be like Michael Phelps. It might be swimming, you know. It might be something that doesn't, you know, line up in the school, traditional school setting. And they may actually be deficient in certain subjects, like Michael Phelps was, you know, ADHD or dyslexic. You know, he had issues with traditional school. So they have this high intensity, high energy level, and at least giftedness in one area. And they also are creative. And when I say creative, I don't mean just regular creative. Their creativity is amazing. Oftentimes I hear parents and teachers and adults with indigos say, you know, I've never seen someone this creative. For example, I had a, a client who she was making a birdhouse, you know, and in her little, you know, six-year-old world birdhouse, the birdhouse had a skylight. It had all sorts of incredible creative things to it that other kids just didn't think of so their creativity is just off the charts so if you if you've run into parents and who've seemed to identified that they have an indigo child do you try to steer them away from a traditional school system because it seems like it could be trouble for them um i would put them my recommendation you know making that school match as we all know having gone through school is so important right you know that's mm -hmm. the first that's the first place you feel like you can either be yourself or you're like oh i can't be myself so you really want to make a good match where they feel like they can be who they came here to be. And oftentimes, you know, indigos and sensitive kids in general, their gifts don't line up with traditional school systems. So I don't always recommend that. I mean, certainly charter schools and Waldorf and Montessori and other schools are oftentimes a better fit. But it depends on the school, depends on the community, depends on the child. But I do recommend places where they really feel like they can be who they are and they don't have to just try and fit in. Because the goal is really to help them develop their gifts and share their unique light here. Yeah, I mean, it seems like the things that you call in the book square peg jobs, you know, doctor, right. lawyer, traditional things. It seems like if a person with this type of energy got shoehorned into one of these types of square peg jobs, that that would be a pretty... A miserable life for someone like that. Well, no, they would just have to do it in a way that worked for them. For example, like Dr. Oz, who might have some indigo energy. Certainly he's on TV and he's doing things and he's all over the place. So they would never be able to do it like, you know, sort of like nine to five. They would be doing whatever they did in an extremely creative way that wasn't done before. That's another thing about these indigos. They're real innovators, right? They really mm -hmm. want to do things differently. That's sort of in their heart and core and soul. And going to something that's just root or memorization is painful for them. So they want that freedom to be creative and express themselves and be able to do things outside of the box. So whether they were a scientist, a scholar, an artist, whatever it is, they would need that freedom to do things differently. Right. I mean, how do you deal with that, encouraging parents to 
give their kids that kind of confidence because you really have to reach a certain level of success before you get that type of freedom in your career. That's true. But, you know, I, I do believe that the world is changing in many ways. And I think that with, you know, the way technology is and the Internet and just the universe, that children are coming into themselves earlier or people are. You know, it used to be like where you had to take a job. You had to just stick with your job until, you know, you made it like you're saying to a certain level and then you could really be who you were. But I think nowadays kids can really express themselves in unique and creative ways. And there's enough creative organizations out there that they can find a way, they can make a way, they can connect with other like-minded people that can support their success. So um, I think kids are really having success earlier with, you know, sharing their unique gifts, and I don't think they need to go down a path, um, you know, that they don't feel like it's who they are. I, mean, I think they need to stay in the flow and be who they are, and I'm not saying don't take a job to, you know, to pay the bills. I'm just saying to always be cultivating their unique gifts and to be working towards their dreams, I think is very real and possible. I agree with you. I mean, something I wanted to step back to your bio a little bit because uh, the, the part where I put in the introduction that you lived at the base of the Himalayas and you worked with Tibetan refugee children. Um, can you give us some insight into what those kind of kids are like? I feel like they've had some pretty extreme life experiences that have probably made them quite different from American children. Right. Well, my first book is called Growing Happy Kids, and that book is about confidence and, and resilience and a deeper type of happiness. And uh, I start that book in, in my experience over there in, in Asia. But um, to answer your question, you know, these kids are resilient kids. You know, these kids, like most kids, are have that inner strength and ability to want to be happy. I mean, that's sort of what ties us all together. Everyone wants to be happy. So... You know, we look for it in different ways, which is why I wrote the book Growing Happy Kids to help sort of adults do some more conscious parenting and teachers and, and people like that. But children, wherever they are around the world, want to be happy, want to express their unique gifts. And indigos and sensitive kids are everywhere. You know, it's not a U.S. thing or it's really I, I have worked with parents over Skype uh, wherever they're located and they've all uh, asked similar questions. So it's pretty incredible. As far as indigos are concerned, give me some of the most extreme examples you've seen of of uh, intuition, of high energy, those type of um, kind of fringe energetic type things. Intuitive. You know, kids often will tell me things before they happen. I've had parents call me and say, hey, my, my daughter is seeing angels. Can I bring her to you? You know, I mean, kids are able to tap into a world that not everyone can see. They have what I would call higher sense perception. They've developed that. You know, they come in with that. And whether they shut it off or they continue to cultivate it, of course, depends on their uh, family and surroundings and experiences. But, you know, I'm a believer that if you are connected to all that there is, I would encourage you keeping that connection. Um, and that involves intuition. Intuition is a very natural thing. I think that, you know, if any of us have gone to, you know, traditional schools, it was sort of drummed out of some people because they were told, you know, hey, we, we, we have all the answers, you don't. But mm -hmm. if you can learn how to trust yourself and to really be open to creativity and your imagination and, and, and spirit, I think that you can stay connected and that you can learn how to navigate our world and be that sensitive. I mean, I really do think most people will have a few examples in their life of their own intuition, but it mm -hmm. seems uh, kind of random. I mean, how would you suggest someone harness or increase that intuition? Um, I think with kids and adults, I mean, I think the first step is really to get in touch with yourself, you know, to really uh, meaning – you know, to calm down and sit still. And it doesn't have to be a closed eyes meditation at first, but you can do a walking meditation to just develop a level of awareness of your breath, of your thoughts, being able to direct your, your feelings and, and get in touch with how you feel. And it is through our breath and it is through our feelings that we get to um, really develop our intuition. And, and there's certain ways in teachers and classes and all that stuff for developing your intuition. One example um, that I've recently gone to is a group of people, you know, you have, you sit in a circle and one person said, you know, we, one person, we all focus on one person and you just get, get whatever you receive intuitively and you don't judge it. You don't interpret it. 
And that person says yes. And oftentimes they come back and say, oh, my God, that's a tremendous confirmation for me. I was thinking X, Y, Z. So sort of like exercising your intuition, like you would exercise your muscles. And as you realize how connected you are and how that you often do have uh, the ability to tap into all that there is and the wisdom of the world, you by the doing it more and more, you build your confidence and you build those muscles. That's really fascinating. I mean, that whole area is kind of foreign to me. I mean, I've, I've explored it a little bit. I've gone to a Reiki master once before, but I didn't feel much of an effect. Uh, I haven't gotten much out of meditation, but with the people that I, that do in my life that I know, they're very grounded and they seem a lot more well-rounded. Um, so it's pretty interesting to me, especially the area of energy healing. Mm -hmm. Um, can you give me some examples of how young kids are discovering they have these types of abilities or how far these abilities can go? Well, well, yeah, my background is a Reiki master, and um, I do provide healing sessions, hands-on healing, to adults and children. But I often teach classes where children are involved, age, usually over the age of seven. And, you know, it's interesting because they're just tuned in, they're connected, where oftentimes when I teach adults, you sort of, I don't want to say you have to convince them, but you have to explain energy and how it works and how the body works and and uh, talk about it. Kids are like, oh, I got this. You know, so oftentimes they'll see color coming out of their hands. They can feel it. They can see angels in the room. I mean, they're, so, they're really sort of tapped in and um, helping them understand energy which everything in the world is energy but helping them be able to learn energy healing i think can be a wonderful thing because it builds their confidence and it starts them thinking from the get-go wow i can uh, there's a power within me that's greater than me and when you really believe that when you know that and you know that you know that you can persevere over any obstacle in your life you know you don't have to think that, you know, X, Y, Z is bigger than me or that's bigger than me. You can realize, you can begin to realize that there's a power greater than you. And, and to grow up with that awareness is incredible. Yeah, I mean, it seems like they have such a jump on, on developing themselves as a well-rounded person than even most adults do. It might be sometimes off-putting if the kids seem to develop faster than their own parents. That puts the dynamic in a weird place. Well, it's interesting because, you know, every family, it, everyone's growing together, right? So in the olden days of parenting, people would think, oh, your parents have the answers and they're going to teach the kids or something like this. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, it's sort of more of an enlightened way of thinking like, you know, we're all in it together. We're all learning. We're all growing. And that's a really healthy way to think of it, as well as um, to realize that these kids, not, you know, psychic and sensitive and indigo kids, you know, they came to us for a reason. We're here to learn as much as they're here to learn. So mm -hmm. that's a really powerful thought. Yeah, that's a good way to look at it, too. I would love to see colors or auras. I mean, I just don't. Is there anything I could do to develop that kind of ability, or am I just kind of stuck? No, I mean, you can certainly learn how to see auras. I mean, it's not complicated. Really? Um, it's, it's, just a, it's just a matter of practice. And I think that your lifestyle, whatever anyone's lifestyle is, really impacts your consciousness. So the healthier you are in all ways, the easier it is to develop higher sense perception. But if you were outside and it was uh, maybe, you know, dusk when the sun is setting, or it can be bright light, but if you sort of... Um, you know, when you close your eyes to more of a fuzzy feeling, like you sort of see things, but it's mm -hmm. a little out of focus. Yeah. You can start to see energy around plants. You can start to see an energy field around plants because all that aura is, is your personal energy field. So um, you're just learning how to see the energy field either around plants, around animals, around people. And um, if you continue to do that and you continue to come from a place of love, um, and not wanting like um, ego, like wanting, I want to see it. I want to see it because it's cool. And I can tell all my listeners <laughs> that, you know, I'm seeing auras now. True. But you really come from the place of like, this is just something I want to develop and experience. You know, it'll happen. And, and then you'll say, oh, yeah, this stuff is for real. <laughs> because I think it is when you have direct experiences with this stuff. Right. that then it's hard to debate it. I mean, you certainly can debate it. But then you've had your own experience. And you go, oh, this really does work. Oh, I totally agree. And that's why, you know, I, I'm looking for that personal validation. I like to explore it. I like to hear about it. But it's all just kind of theory until I have some type of experience. So I'm still looking. Haven't had it yet. But um, 
<laughs> but know. it is one of those things also that, you know, I don't want to say be careful what you ask for, but if you do ask for it, the universe will always bring you the people and the books and the places that will be the perfect right step for you. That's something I've heard before, too. The universe <laughs> tends to unfold as it should. <laughs> mm-hmm. But, well, back to kids. You know, it's funny to me because everyone likes to just see kids being kids. The other day I was actually in traffic court and a lady had to bring her son who was like this little four-year-old kid and couldn't sit still and didn't understand the seriousness of, of court. And it was it was just hilarious because when she was dismissed, the kid stood up on his chair and yelled, goodbye, everybody, in like a <laughs> totally quiet room, you know, and – Sometimes I wonder if that mindset of children just being lighthearted, super friendly and having fun everywhere. I sometimes wonder if those things really fade away naturally or if as we grow up or if that's the natural state of people there. And it has to be aggressively weeded out by the eight hours a day, five days a week for a lifetime. Well, I think um, laughter is the first stage of wisdom. So if you and if you look at any brilliant teacher on this planet, like, you know, His Holiness, the Dalai Lama or people that I can think of other people, too, Mm -hmm. they have a natural sense of joy and laughter. You know, they've been able to cultivate something within them that isn't dependent on outside circumstances to be lighthearted. You know, they're they come to it from not just their heart, but also their mind. They understand that when you're happy and you're joyful, you know, that kind of, that stuff increases in your life. And that, you know, when we focus on the negative, that stuff increases. So doing it from, you know, sort of this enlightened self-interest, learning how to be lighthearted about things is a really healthy, happy thing. And it does lend itself to developing intuition. Yeah. I mean, that's so well said because I've always, thought, you know, it's cliche that laughter is the best medicine, but I've always enjoyed comedy amongst all other things. It's how I've dealt with every frustrating aspect of life. And they, and then I just recently, a friend showed me uh, videos of this laughter meditation and it looks really weird and off-putting, mm-hmm. but just groups of people forcing themselves to laugh until it becomes <laughs> contagious and natural. Um, it's very goofy, but I can understand how that would release endorphins and make someone actually happier. Absolutely. I haven't done the meditation, but I, I you know, just the idea of it makes me want to laugh because <laughs> because it's true. I mean, it's true that laughter really is one of the best medicines. I mean, it's certainly from a biological perspective, like you just said, it really lifts your body up. And another thing in the book that you have that I thought was interesting is you mentioned that these new kids, Indigo kids, are a lot more tech savvy right out of the gate. And they have like this innate knowledge of how to use modern technology. Uh, that's pretty interesting because I've recently been thinking about the idea that I know a lot of people who have kids who are just picking up iPads and iPhones and really getting it. And I sometimes wonder if that's validation for the uh, that thing they call the hundredth monkey effect. Are you familiar with that? Yes. yes. Yeah. Like the, yeah. The, for people who aren't, it's, you know, the idea that scientists were watching monkeys teach their kids how to wash food in a river. And once a number of monkeys who learned how to do this hit a critical mass, the proverbial one hundredth monkey could do it. Uh, instinctively without needing to be shown. And I wonder if that's what's happening with technology or with Indigo Kids, is it to a stronger degree? Well, I think, you know, children are born of the consciousness in which they come into. So, you know, we are a connected planet right now and they are born connected. They just get technology. And oftentimes, you know, children are born in for sometimes for a reason that we can't even imagine. Maybe they're going to be a spaceship mechanic, right? So. Right. So the idea is that they are just naturally tech savvy, in particular indigos, but mostly most kids, of course. Um, But it's 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 just a fascinating idea. I just tweeted. I'm on the Twitter uh, at MD Healy, and I just read that the first U.S. school went all digital in their textbooks. So I thought that was pretty great. Whoa, that is great. Do you know where that is? I do. It's in White Plains, New York. Interesting. Uh, yeah. And I thought at first I was like, really? Because, you know, that's not how I went to school. So we had that experience of change. Like, can that really work? And then as I was watching the video and I was thinking about it, I'm like, this is a wonderful step in the right direction because we are all connected. And these kids can access any textbook of their school. So if they're really interested in something or they want to look at the year before them and clarify an issue, I mean, it really allows them to be engaged in learning in a whole new way. I agree. I mean, it can be such a distraction, you know, especially video games and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But 
it's not going away. So if you can harness social media right. and harness the ability to, to use these tools at an early age, you could do some pretty creative uh, stuff. Right. And it, and it forces teachers to be at the top of their game. They got to be on top of it. They got to watch kids. They got to get engaged. They got to make sure they're really doing their work, like you said. Yeah. I mean, I know people my age that are in their late 20s that still don't know how to use Facebook or Twitter and they just mm -hmm. don't care. And it's like, you know, that's fine. But you're going to be one of the very few 50 year olds in 20 years who don't know this stuff. You're just cut out of that section. And it's a huge section of our social interactions. Well, from my perspective, you know, it, it doesn't matter if you use it or not, but as long as you're aware of it and if it's and if it's at least something you can try and decide if it works for you, because it is a great way to get information and you can turn it off like everything. I'm all for days where there's no hookup to technology and you go out in the woods or the beach or wherever it is. Yeah, that's I do think that's important, too. You have to unplug once in a while. Mm -hmm. But Internet culture, though, it's uh. I really love it because it's some it's very goofy sometimes, but at other times it also is really um, it's communal, you know, way mm -hmm. more communal than we get in our capitalistic society. Mm -hmm. And I think that might be part of the awakening as well. And I like the idea how flat Twitter is. I mean, I don't want to bore, bore listeners, but the idea that you really can communicate with people of all different levels, of all different backgrounds, of all New York Times bestselling authors to someone who just graduated college. Who knows? You know, you really can uh, connect with people in a great way. Yeah, you cut out a lot of those middlemen. I think that's mm -hmm. part of the appeal. People love the idea that some celebrity might say something to them, or at, at the very least, they get to hear the thoughts of people they admire mm -hmm. without it being filtered through The Tonight Show or something right. like that. Mm -hmm. So that's interesting. Well, judging by the most common personality traits and values that you see in these kids, if you gave control of the government and society to a group of, say, 10 or 20 indigo kids, what changes do you think that they would make? Well, they would, they would cut out all the nonsense. I mean, they, the, these kids are, you know, say we got the best and the brightest of 20 of these sensitive indigo kids. Right. They would be really clear that it, it wouldn't be hierarchical. It would be more partnership. There would be more, um, more equality, equanimity. And they would also be really focused on things that mattered to them. You know what I mean? They they wouldn't, they're not as much, they're not very good with bureaucracy. For example, they hate rules. So if they put rules in place, you'd be, be sure that it was for a reason. You know, they wouldn't have rules to have rules. It would be like, okay, we, can, we have to do that. We want streets and blocks. And, you know, they're, they would move things forward in a way that worked for more people. So I think that that's really the opportunity in our consciousness now, meaning that these kids were really watching consciousness in action. We're watching our evolution. And uh, these children, uh, many of them with the proper guidance and mentorship and support and things like that, have the opportunity or poten potential to do great things. But I will say they also can be very challenging too. So kids that um, have this intensity and this sensitivity, if they don't get the right guidance, you know, they can become depressed and they can become anxious and they can they can uh, not use their intensity for good means. So it's really important that when we see these kids that we can see their potential and help. Yeah, I mean, they could at least probably do better than a government shutdown. <laughs> but if they shut down, it would be for a really good reason. Let's put it that <laughs> way. It wouldn't be for just, you know, budget stuff. It would be interesting to see, and it'd be nice if we elected the best and brightest of anything. You know, right. like we we don't elect scientists or biologists or sociologists. Like our politicians are literally experts in nothing. Right, right. <laughs> well, I mean, I think you know, there. I forgot the name of the school. I should look it up. But there's a school that is run by the children, and it's a wonderful example of what would happen. I think for a government. It, I mean, in the school, the school works. It really, really, really works. So they have like board meetings with all the kids. So you know, it is a great idea to see, you know, what would change. Yeah. I mean, I wonder about that with my own kids. I mean, my girlfriend and I, we sometimes uh, talk about the idea if we had kids, what we would do. Sometimes we think about homeschooling, but then I worry about all the pressure on myself to do that. You know, that's a lot. And also their interaction with other kids. So it's like, I don't know if I want to do that. But then public school to me seems like a joke. But then at the same time, I'm like, maybe they should go to public school and I'll give them a real education at home because I want my kids to be able to interact with normal people still, even if they understand that we're being put through the ringer in all these weird ways. 
Well, it's interesting because there are some places on the planet in the U.S. where homeschooling doesn't just mean their parents are teaching them at home. There's homeschooling groups where they've organized different teachers and such so that homeschooling is more social and that can, and if done correctly, they can really get wonderful things from there where they're not held back by grade level stuff. You know what I'm saying? They can be more engaged. They can work on things that they're really interested in and they can have education in a way that, you know, you really want to learn. You go to school, you're like, okay, great. I'm working on XYZ project. I really want to work on this versus saying, oh no, not math again. (laughs) So. So there, there is ways to make homeschooling work depending upon where you live and what's available. But there are, there are creative resources for adults with children who are, have that intensity and the sensitivity and the intuition that we're talking about. Yeah, I mean, do you have any other examples of alternative schooling? Because that's really interesting to me. Yeah, I mean, I think that there's homeschooling cooperatives. I think there's Waldorf. I think there's a lot of charter schools. I know a lot of other schools that are really um, doing their best to help children learn in ways that work for them. Because, you know, I think that since these children are not programmable, you know, they're going to do what they want to do. Of course, there's times when it's non-negotiable. You need to brush your teeth. You need to go to bed or whatever it is we can work with them on. Right. The way that they learn, they need to be engaged. They need to be active. They need to be studying things of interest to them. Even if it's a subject that's not interested to them, they have to learn it in ways that they feel engaged. So the way we deliver education is going to have to change because we're just at sort of the tipping point where so many kids are sensitive that, you know, the regular school system won't work. It will, it will, you know, I know a lot of kids that come home, I say, oh, you know, how was school today? And they go, oh, no, it wasn't, you know, I mean, (laughs) and and parents, a lot of parents and adults have just said, you know, that's, it is what it is, but it doesn't have to be that way. You know what I mean? There there are other creative ways. It's so sad that a lot of parents will say that to their kids. You know, kids say, oh, school sucked. And it's like, yeah, well, school is going to suck. And then they're, <laughs> they're coming home from a job that sucks. And they're like, yeah, well, you know, once you know a school work's going to suck. And it's like no one along the line wants to make a better structure for their own kids when the one they went through didn't make them happy. Right, right. And the thing is, there are a lot of indigos that have become adults now. So there is adult indigos now. Although I, my book, The Energetic Keys to Indigo Kids, focuses on indigo children, but there are a lot of adult indigos. And those are the, the people who are saying, hey, we're not dealing with this regular school stuff. We're going to make it, we're going to do it in a way that works. So we'll continue to see shifts in the educational system, and, and they will be for good. And so is Indigo Kid kind of like a. Uh... I mean, it seems like sort of a broad term, but is there any way to completely identify one? Like, or is it all kind of vague? Well, I mean, I think that the key pieces, um, I mean, there's not like, I can't, I can't give them a blood test right now and say, right, <laughs> yeah, of course. But, but I mean, certainly if you have higher sense perception and you're able to see the indigo aura, that would be a, that would be a big clue. But um, from a characteristic standpoint, in my book, The Energetic Keys to Indigo Kids, I have page 28 and 29. They all talk about the descriptions and characteristics. And adults who have children who are highly intense uh, have this energy of defiance. And adults know if their kids are like, I refuse to do this. They know if that's an everyday thing. Mm -hmm. And also with that sensitivity, meaning bright lights, the smells, the sounds, the word people say to them. They know if they have a highly sensitive child who has that intensity to them and also has that sort of warrior energy and has that shared mindset where they want things to be equal and they want things to be fair. And I can keep going down the list. They want to be partnered with. They don't want to be told what to do. And, you know, adults know if that fits their child Mm -hmm. or they have something else. But, you know, I've just seen so many indigo kids come into my office that I thought it was time to write a book that so more adults would realize, oh, okay, there's nothing wrong with my child. Maybe I think they're challenging and difficult, but when I really understand them better, I can have more success with them and I can help them have more success with their own lives. And um, so when you go through the characteristics, even though it's not black and white, adults typically know if that they're nodding their head if they've got an indigo child. They know from their experience of raising a child if their child just has occasional tantrums or if it's an everyday thing. Yeah, because it seems a lot of those things on the list – uh, outside of the energetic stuff, fit the profile for most creative people I know growing up. And I think, well, I think a whole, well, you know, like I mentioned, there's that big umbrella of sensitive kids and creative, uh, blatantly creative people. They're always under the sensitive kids umbrella. 
But mm -hmm. the indigo child in particular is the one who's highly sensitive and also has an intensity and fierceness to them. So, you know, they could, you know, that's just, mm -hmm. that's their energy. So it's learning how to channel that energy, whether it's jumping on a trampoline, whether it's reading a book, whether it's playing soccer, every day they need to channel that energy or it can go in the wrong direction. It's really interesting because it's almost like the universe is manifesting what it needs. You know, kids that uh, want things to be equal, they don't like hierarchy, they don't like yeah. rules, they don't like s structures holding them down. And it's funny because you say they're they're more resistant. It's maybe because the universe put out some kids a couple generations ago, and then they're like, well, that one didn't work. we got to get kids that are more intense. You know, we're going to have to have kids that are intense enough to overcome this structure that we're involved in. I do I do think that you're right. I think that, uh, you know, the the beings and children that are incarnate now are exactly the right children for our point in our planet's evolution. You know, they're here mm -hmm. because they want to make systems and things to work for more people. I mean, we all want that, but they have the fierceness and the determination and the stick with itness to make it happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, you mentioned a bit ago, and you also have in the book, you talk about the way that parenting needs to evolve. And I strongly agree again, you know, yeah. but what are some of the biggest ways that you like the biggest mistakes that you see parents making today? That's sort of a loaded question, but let's see. <laughs> um, some common mistakes that I see is um, one of them is that, you know, a lot of parents think that their child needs to be good at everything. And that's just not the way we are. We're all, right. pat we're all patterned for our unique purpose. So a child might be really good in English, but might think in math or a child might be really good at science and not good in, you know, a foreign language. I, the point is to help them be who they came here to be and give them the life skills and help them learn what they need so they can balance the checkbook and they learn they can learn how to take care of themselves and be responsible. But we don't want to raise cookie cutter kids. You know, we don't want kids to be just like everyone else. We want to celebrate their uniqueness. So oftentimes I think that adults fall into just the regular sort of peer pressure of society that I want my kid to be great at this and great at this. And when oftentimes we just need to step back and say, okay, who is this child and how can I help them be who they came here to be, not who I want? That's true. And mm -hmm. I've always said as a parent that I would have my kid playing an instrument. I'd have him involved in martial arts. I mm -hmm. teach him about diet because I want to make a powerhouse who has a lot of tools in their toolbox when they're 18 to 20 and they can make money for themselves creatively because they aren't so useless as to have to go get a job as a target cashier or flipping burgers at Wendy's, you know? Not and, that uh, there's anything wrong with those jobs. Those are honest jobs. <laughs> not that there's probably. anything wrong with that. <laughs> but um, yeah, no, I, I of course. But you know, it seems like a lot of times parents are just along for the ride rather than being an active participant and building a person that's going to be able to do great things. Yeah, and I mean, I think what occurs to me while you're saying that is that, you know, we just want to have a level of awareness in our own lives that, you know, that it's not about us raising the kids as much as it is about all of us growing together and being able to help them be who they came here to be. And that might, like we said, be different than we think and help them connect with who they are and allow them to flourish in ways that work for them, whether it's their school, whether it's their friends, whether it's, you know, the unique interests that they have. Yeah, I mean, you think the most important tools are probably just, I mean, you want to get out of their way and let them manifest their creativity in their own way, but it's pretty important to build their confidence. You know, a lot of these kids, especially in the book, you have several cases of kids that are bullied in school. Mm-hmm. You got to build that confidence so they realize, you know, hey, I'm doing my I'm doing my thing. And that's fine, even though it's different from everybody else. And there was no one there when I was young to really say that, to say, right. you know, the things you're doing, you know, you're, you're creative, you're doing things your own way. And uh, eventually that's going to flourish into something for you. Right. Well, I mean, I think that you make a good point. And that's why I wrote the Growing Happy Kids book first, because that's all about how to develop a deeper sense of resilience and confidence. And sensitive children need that more than anyone. So the whole point is to develop that inner strength and that resilience so they can have the courage to share their unique gifts. And also, you know, to answer your other question that you had for me, I think a big piece of the puzzle is, of course, you know, happiness yourself, becoming someone who's creative and engaged in the world and sharing your gifts. I think that's being a role model for your kids is essential that, you know, really realizing that the happier you are, the better it is for your kids. So taking the time to really nurture yourself, I think as an adult and parent and teacher, I think is incredibly valuable. 
Yeah. And I know it can be super hard, I'm sure, as a parent, because I have so many bad habits that, you know, <laughs> for just not having a great example in areas like diet mm -hmm. um, and, and early life consumerism. And I think people just forget that every moment they're with their kids, their kids are absorbing what they're doing. And I'm going to eat fast food all the time, but my kids, I'm pretty sure, aren't going to be seeing that. And uh, I just think that's pretty important. You know, I'm, I'm a lost cause, but I can probably I can help inspire someone, some young kid to be better, you know. Right. And also, I mean, I think that, like you just said, kids are always watching. So being honest with them and, and you know, really doing your best. And when you make mistakes, you know, we all make mistakes telling them, hey, you know, I could have probably done that better. I think having that genuine relationship with kids will go really far because at one point in your life, you might want them to call you when they're a teenager and people are drinking and getting into a car and say, hey, mom, can you pick me up? You want to be able to have that relationship with them yes. that's really genuine, that they can feel like, okay, I, I can really talk to my mom or my dad. It's not, you're not off limits. So that's important. Totally agree. I, some of the most authoritarian parents when I was younger, their kids acted out harder than anyone's. You know, a lot of kids were doing drinking, but the ones whose parents were super strict, those are the ones who were going to the hospital and getting charcoal shoved down their throat. Mm -hmm. You know, those are the ones who are just going hog wild. And I think there really is something to that. You, you react, you know, uh, strongly against that opposition. Mm -hmm. And if you, if you aren't putting yourself in that position of being a super strict authoritarian, you can be more of a guide. You know, they can actually talk to you because if you're too authoritarian, the kid's like, well, I can't fucking talk to them. Right. They, they have no idea what I'm thinking. Right. And also, you know, I mean, you, you, you want, you want to be able to be available to them. You know I mean? And I think that adults often parent the way they were parented until they take a pause and say, okay, how was I parented? What worked for me? What didn't? And whatever didn't work for you, just drop it. Don't do that. Do it differently. I agree. Um, it seems so simple, but it, it's so funny that we're in the position we're in. Uh, mm -hmm. Another thing, you know, I've always felt like the people that are in charge in government and making real serious decisions in society are of a much older generation who's completely out of touch. I think everybody has that experience, you know, as, when they're in their 20s and 30s. But as Indigo kids start to fill some of these roles in society that where they're going to actually be making important decisions, how do you think society is going to change? you think we're going to see a real benefit? Oh, without question. Uh, you know, I mean, Indigo kids that have been, uh, that have really started to nurture their strengths and skills and have the wherewithal to, you know, focus their gifts for the greater good, we'll, we'll see Certainly positive differences. I mean, not every indigo is going to be stellar, let's be honest, but certainly they all have that potential. And I know that the ones that uh, focus on using their talents for the greater good will do that. They have such great compassion. That's one of their shared qualities. Important. So w when they use that, they really can help transform things. That's my hope. I'm, I'm with you. I mean, that's really the main reason I have such an interest in the idea that these kids are changing and that there's an awakening taking place. It's it's a hopeful thought in a hopeless world. But uh, <laughs> regardless, it's about that time. You know, thanks so much for being here. It's been great talking to you. Uh, again, the book is The Energetic Keys to Indigo Kids. Uh, do you have a website or any events? My website is growinghappykids.com, and I'm on Twitter at MDHealy. Awesome. Do you have any upcoming events or anything like that? Do you do go on occasional uh, speaking tours, right? I, I do. I'm going to be in Mountain View, California in January, but I, I'm 